Right. Well, folks, we are just after the top of the hour, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to this webcast. We've got uh, an exciting afternoon ahead. I recognize some of the faces that are on the, uh, the video and not others, and maybe others will join as we go along. I should uh, comment straight up that we are recording this session, so we need to mind our language and our P's and Q's and make sure that this is um, as, uh, as open and free a conversation as possible. But we are recording so that others that aren't joining at the moment uh, can listen in. So welcome, whether you're joining virtually uh, or whether you're virtually joining live. My name is Gib Bullock and um, I will try and share my screen just to give you a little bit of an introduction uh, to myself. Let's see if the technology can work here. Okay. Um, I'll start with an introduction to myself and then I'll bring in other speakers and go through the, uh, the, the agenda that we have in front of us just now. So, I am, um, in terms of the list of characters, and you'll see that we're doing this quite tongue in cheek uh, in terms of the decelerator. We have a list of Avenger characters, and you're going to meet some of them today. Uh, my Avenger character is the entrepreneur, and that is something, I suppose, a title that uh, came to me from 20 or so years in the corporate sector, much of that time trying to change business from within and trying to drive change inside a large organization. I was running the nonprofit arm of Accenture. Uh, I prefer to call it the not for loss arm of Accenture, but this was a sort of maverick kind of guerrilla movement within Accenture trying to change just a slightly the direction of the, the mothership. And that's very much uh, central to what we're trying to do with this concept of deceleration. And I'll move straight into that just now while I'm, uh, I'm, I'm talking. This pile of bricks with a strange large uh, standing stone in front of it, uh, four and a half thousand year old standing stone, is called Craig Beeroch Farm. It happens to be about two fields away from where I grew up on a Scottish island called the Isle of Butte. And the vision, the crazy vision that uh, I had was to create what I'm calling a business decelerator. So if you sort of, uh, this is the artist's impression or the, the architect's impression of what this derelict thing might look like if it's brought back to life from um, the ruins that it currently is. And my hope is to create a place where business people, like I was and I guess maybe I'm, business people in large organizations, it could also be people working in the charity sector or government sector, but to bring these sectors together and slow people down, give people a chance to actually disconnect to reconnect, which is the theme of this webinar, to have a chance to get away from the 60, 70 hour, always connected working week and actually connect with music, with art, with improv, as we'll hear about, with nature and community, and in the hope that that will not just make them um, more robust and, and drive resilience and improve well-being. And we know there's a problem of that in the, in the business world, but actually to unleash creativity, to connect people to their own sense, sense of purpose. And that's this whole concept of deceleration. The term is not original to me. I think there's been some articles around business deceleration in the past, but what it is not is just another one of these retreat centers that you can go to and, um, and relax for a while. This is a retreat center with a difference. This is a retreat center to, to really awaken dormant change makers inside these large ecosystems, business ecosystems, and pivot them towards purpose. And the way I want to do that uh, is to bring in a cadre of interesting and unusual people. And that's a good segue to the next part of our agenda, which is the intro to the speakers. So you've heard who I am. Um, I'm very delighted that there's some friends and colleagues uh, from the world of art and business and improv that have agreed to be part of this crazy undertaking, this crazy journey. And they're gonna share their thoughts and their perspectives on this today. So without further ado, I'll go to the first one. I think um, you will see David in a corner. You'll need to unmute yourself in a second, David, but your nickname is the maestro and people can read about your background in the bio, but do you wanna sort of bring this to, to life in your own words? You're on mute. Oh, yeah, you have to mute. 
I have to unmute you. Oh, oh, right. <laughs> Why can't I unmute you? Ta -da. Uh, there you are. Fantastic. Un I've been unmuted. Unleashed. Thanks, Kip. I love what you're saying. I love that dormant, awakened dormant change makers. Um, yeah, so briefly, this, the, the Tongue in the Chief title refers to my musical background. And I've, uh, I've been a musician all my life. And I think, I think this idea of deceleration is super important in the work I do with businesses and, and, and other organizations, particularly um, the fact that we live at a tempo that is increasingly uh, incessant and fast. And I'm really interested to see about how we can unilaterally change our tempo, even when the world carries on at its own speed, because it's, it'd be, you know, it's obviously it's great if you can go to a beautiful place such as Gibbs found, but the question is how are we going to find the Cray Baroque when we're in the busiest city at the busiest time. So that's really what interests me. <laughs> Thanks, David. And um, what, it, what David didn't say is that um, he was trained uh, to sing classical opera with uh, Placido Domingo and you worked with Stanley Kubrick and all sorts of things like that. So you're uh, a modest man, David, but uh, we look forward <laughs> to getting your art. Next stop, next up, if I can move forward, Alexander. Now, I probably need to unmute you as well. Um, here we are. You are unmuted, Alex. Over I am unmuted. Thank you. Well, look, it's a genuine privilege to be here. So my speciality is creativity and how do you transform creativity into impact? So kind of building on what David was just talking about there. His is the auditory part of art. Mine is the visual part of art. So my experience is painting in extreme locations all over the world, in blizzards on top of mountains, in uh, high winds, kind of 50, 60 mile an hour winds. Um, and what those experiences have taught me is how do you connect to that inner part of yourself that David was just touching on there? Because creativity, the vehicle for creativity is your heart, your soul, your essence, your spirit, whatever you call it, doesn't really matter. The problem is that today most of us have disconnected from that part of ourselves. And so what I've uh, worked on with individuals, teams, organizations, is a series of techniques to help them to unlock that creativity. And one of the key techniques is purpose. Another technique is collaborative paintings. And there are many, many other techniques. Uh, but ultimately, what are we looking for? for individuals, teams, and organizations to be valued for who they truly are. And my wish is for all of us to be able to do that. And I actually believe that if you look at the big issues that we face today, some of which David was touching on, those really big issues like the sustainable development goals, poverty, climate change, you know, where we see the planet is out of balance, or at least humanity is out of balance with the planet, actually you can trace those back through organizations all the way down to each and every one of us. Each and every one of us at some level is out of balance. So what happens when you recognize yourself and value yourself for who you truly are? You rebalance yourself. And if we all do that, then our organizations will start to rebalance. If we rebalance our organizations, then society will start to rebalance itself. So that's a little bit about me. Excellent, thanks. Thanks, Alex. And um, moving on to the jester. So we have two for the price of one, actually, uh, here with uh, Vicky and John. I mean, v Vicky, do you want to sort of uh, introduce yourself and pass to John in terms of uh, the nickname, the jesters, and what that means? Absolutely. So picking up from what David and Alex were speaking about, um, David will be working on the musical side of things, Alex on, on visual arts, and we'll be here bringing, representing the performing arts at Craig B. Rock. Um, so John and I are part of an improv troupe. We perform regularly in Geneva. And for me, uh, one of the things I love most about theater and performance, which I've been doing for most of my life, is that you create a team who's all working towards the same goal. And it's, uh, it's a really uh, collaborative, co-creative and magical process sometimes. And, uh, and what I've discovered in recent years is that if you bring that theater and improv mindset into the business world, they can also do magical things. Over to John. 
Thanks, Vicki, and hello, everyone. And lest anybody think you need to be a performer to do improv, for many years I was a lawyer in one of Canada's biggest law firms in Toronto, and I then moved to Geneva, where I worked for the United Nations before leaving to start my own business in the public speaking field. And let me tell you, it's for everybody. It's something that is for everyone. And I think Gibb, in his very, his very fine description of what he hopes to achieve with the decelerator, uh, one of the things that for me was a revelation of improv that really fits into this whole philosophy is that for improv to work, you really forget about yourself. You're actually focusing on other people. You're listening to them. You're collaborating with them. And when it's all over, you look back and together you've produced something. And it's a great thing that I think fits into this whole, um, this whole initiative that Gibbs trying to uh, promote. Thanks, John. Thanks all. Okay, so let's move into the, um, the, the meat of the discussion, if you will. How can we disconnect to uh, reconnect? So just before I go back to um, a more interactive, if you will, discussion with our, um, our, our, our cast, let me just say to people that you can um, listen away, feel free to ask questions, you can put things into the chat. I've got Nick sitting beside me here, uh, in, uh, in my apartment here in, in Geneva, Switzerland, and, and Nick's manning the chat, um, and we'll, we'll stop periodically and make sure that your questions are, are answered, or you can put up your hand, I think, electronically. So, um, without further ado, uh, I mean, David, we just come back to you. How can we disconnect to reconnect? What, what's your sort of tips on, on that from your craft, if you will? Have I muted you again? I thought I'd unmuted all the speakers. Ah. Okay, thank you. Oh, there you are. There it's you like are. <laughs> you're keeping oh. these beasts under control and you sort of just let us off the leash every so often. I just wish I had that ability to do that to you in sort of, you know, normal life in some way. But anyway, here, here, here you go. The floor is yours. What was the question? <laughs> how, can we, how can we decelerate? In the, what, say it again. Yeah. Disconnect to, to reconnect. Answer it whichever way you want. You're, yeah, you're I mean, trapped. No, I mean, it, isn't it funny how the word, it just struck me, the word connect uh, is used a lot these days. And it often means quite different things, uh, actually diametrically opposed things. So how connected are you often means how, how many, you know, social media platforms are you on? How much time do you spend on these things? And then again, also connection has got a lot to do with the opposite of that in some ways, which is connecting to people. And I think the area that I've been found myself working more in, having worked in theatre and so on, is, is this live area. And you'll see from some of my blurb that the thing that's really got me recently is this um, non-profit I run called Street Wisdom. And it's really about using the streets um, to uh, think differently. And so I have come to understand that, you know, this, this disconnecting it's very often, it's, it's in a way disconnecting from the, the internal chatter and actually connecting with what's going on around you, not just with your eyes and ears, all your senses and so on. And so in, 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 a, in a weird way, you could say the opposite, that it's about connecting to disconnect. So I, I think it'll be interesting in Craig Barat because, because uh, we typically think uh, of, of a beautiful rural landscape, such as you're creating there as a place to disconnect. But I have a feeling that when you disconnect from the internal yak to yak that, that, that we busy ourselves, there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually what you know, our brain is good at doing is that we can really reconnect with embodied intelligence. You know, that our intelligence is actually distributed around and in my view, beyond our bodies. So I'm hoping that what people be able to do is, is um, even though it appears to be disconnect, disconnecting in a traditional way, I'm going off to a retreat, it will actually be an advance and people will become actually uh, um, as Alex was saying, more yourselves, you discover more of yourselves. That's just so, thought. so with the Street Wisdom, which is a very interesting um, little organization that you've, you've created, uh, I mean, to my mind, so many people are walking along, you even see people walking along on their cell phones, walking across the street with the headphones in and, you know, in front of cars or w whatever. The whole concept of that is actually giving people, you, you walk slowly, you you, you are off technology, you're seeing things that you've maybe passed every day, but you see them in a different light. Is that the kind of idea? 
Yeah, I think I think it's got to do with appreciation. If if you slow down, as you say, and you and you notice your judgments and do a number of tune ups so that you can really tune in, everywhere is beautiful. And I believe we've done it in some pretty ugly streets around the place. But the idea is that if you really appreciate where you are, when you are, and you start sort of noticing what you'd otherwise miss. I mean, artists know all about this. You know, it's about spotting things that people miss. You become deeply appreciative and you know you see beauty everywhere and there are answers to your questions everywhere um i think it's important to think that because as um as beautiful as a place like craig brock is and as this wonderful um venture is not everyone will be able to go there i mean we hope many many people will but the question is how we do we then bring that back into this into the world in which we live so that's I, I i'm interested to see how that will work out we'll, we'll come back to that in a second i'm keen to bring in some other other voices as well um into this i mean uh, just in, in the same order alex may be going to to you as well i mean you go up to the top of mountains like the you know salev behind geneva or even mont blanc and things like that and are you disconnected when you go up there or are you connected to something else <laughs> Uh, let, yeah, I'm just going to question. Let, let me pick up on that theme of connection and actually ask a question, not just of you, but of actually everyone on this call. And it really picks up on what David was talking about. So let me ask this question. When do your best ideas come to you? When do your very best ideas come to you? And feel free to add your answers into the chat. And if you don't know where the chat is, just go down to the bottom of the screen, click on chat and you'll see there and just, just add your answer in. And that's a question I've asked of hundreds of people all over the world. When do your very best ideas come to you? And it's really interesting that the answers I get, you know, I've asked this of people in their 20s. I've asked this of people in their 80s. I've asked this of people who have a very different background than my background. You know, I was brought up in, in the UK. I've asked this of people in Japan, the US, uh, basically all over the world. And so we're getting some of the answers in. So during walks in nature, walking in the forest, sleep, shower, when I'm about to fall asleep, when I am asleep, um, when I'm asleep or when I'm properly switched off from work, staring at the ocean, lakes, dunes. Do you know, what is the theme that connects all of you? Chatting to friends, chatting to family. Um, I've had other answers, you know, as um, David said, just before you fall asleep, just after you wake up in the middle of the night, on the plane, the train, gardening, um, cooking, cleaning, driving the car, talking to friends, when I'm facing a deadline. Um, so what is the common theme that connects all of these answers? And I think one or two of you are beginning to answer it. So John's saying, in the spaces in between. And in fact, I think somebody uh, a little bit earlier said, um, when I'm switched off from work, do you know what? In all the thousands of people I've asked this question, I have never once had somebody say, when I'm sitting at my desk working, why is that? Why do we not tap into it when we're sitting at our desk? Because creativity comes when we get out of our head and into our body. And the vehicle for creativity is the sixth sense, our intuition. And it's the first five senses, our sight, our hearing, our touch, our taste, and our smell, which connects us to the world outside. So as the amount of information increases in the world outside with artificial intelligence and big data and all of these other big trends that David's touching on and the speed of the things which are happening on the street, what's happening is we're being overwhelmed, our senses are being overwhelmed, and that of course is suppressing our sixth sense, which is the doorway to creativity. And creativity flows from the body you know, upwards and you know, if you look at cutting edge neurology, they're starting to understand that the brain is not just this thing in our head, it's also our heart, it's our gut, and it's the spinal cord which connects them. And then if you go further back and you look at some of the greatest artists in the world, something like Vincent van Gogh famously said, I painted with my heart and my soul, and in the process, I lost my mind. So why is it, and why is it that when we disconnect to our work and we reconnect to something as david said greater than us something perhaps outside of the body that then flows through us that's where we feel more connected with who we truly are so that would be my uh my few thoughts to share with the group
and would be interested in comments. Meditating as well. Um, so there are more more comments coming in. No, I appreciate that, um, and I love this uh, this notion of the the space uh, between the notes. Thanks, Alex, uh, for that. Quite quite inspiring. I'm going to come to the the jesters now. Um, both uh, both jesters, John and and, and Vicky. Um, either of you, in fact, are you? Um, I need to unmute you as well. I'm unmuting Vicky, and I'm unmuting John. You are improv, so let you let me allow you to improvise your answers to this. Who's going first? You should know telepathically between you. Yeah, I'll go first. John knew that. Um, so, I when I see the question of how can we disconnect to reconnect, I think of the same thing as you give of how more and more of our time is spent uh, online and on devices. And what I find so exciting about the uh, all the various disciplines that are coming to Craig Burock is that you can't be on your phone when you're doing them. Um, and so I'll speak to what I know, which is improv. You need to be so present in the moment, listening to the other people uh, playing the game with you or on stage with you. It's just not possible to be anywhere but there in the moment. Um, and when everyone else is there in the moment as well, you're truly connecting. So for me, I take it very literally. I hope that at Craig Bureau, people will be able to put their phones down, disconnect from all that chatter that, that's important to deal with, but that, that you don't need to be dealing with 24 seven and get a chance to just connect with the people who are there in the space with you and see what you can discover. John? I've been meditating now for about six years. It's something I wish I would have started 30 years ago. But the one thing, perhaps the most important thing that I've learned from it is that it's not about stilling your mind all the time because there are things we have to think about, you know, when we're on a big project, on a deadline, doing our taxes, all these busy things that we have to do. But it's about being able to catch yourself in any moment and realize when the mind is racing, just step back and just pause and think. And what I, one of the things I put in the chat about where do ideas come from, I said the place, the space is in between. And what I meant by that was that I've become better, certainly not perfect, I've got a long way to go, but better at when I transition from one thing to another, just to actually stop and think, I'm leaving this and I'm going to this. And in the general context about getting people up to Craig Baruch and, and to get them away, for me, it's less about them disconnecting and more about them refocusing their attention on other things and about realizing that there are these other things and that they are as important, if not more important than the things that are sitting back on their desk at the office. So I think it's, it's being able to, again, focus on one thing at a time, what is in front of you without thinking about all these other things we have going on. I have to say that I'm, I'm really loving uh, hearing Craig Biroch um, pronounced in Canadian and English accent. Craig Biroch. <laughs> that was that must that was in the, the accent of Shrek, I think there. But um, I, I, I want to probe out Vicky or, or or John this notion of imp people think improv is something to go and listen to on a Saturday night and make us laugh, right? So it's but it's not just about we've deliberately talked about improv for innovation here and and how this you work with business people often in workshops and things. So help me understand how this is going to help people in their day job. Sure. Um, if I, you know, if I could start, I mean, I think those who know the, the comedian Bill Murray from Saturday Night Live, he said improv is the most important teamwork that was, has been done since they built the pyramids. And it's this idea that, you know, you are, when you are part of a team at work, the skills that Yes, it is fast and it's funny and it's crazy, but if you go on a website like Harvard Business Review or Forbes or Fortune or Fast Company, you will find dozens of articles about how the skills of improv are relevant for the business world. And I'll give you just one quick example. There's one game that we, we, we do that involves, it's in pairs, and two people go back and forth one sentence at a time together building a story. But the rule is, is that the last letter of your last word has to be the first letter of my first word. So if you said, yesterday I saw a dog, 
my sentence would have to begin with a word that begins with the letter G. And it goes back and forth and people have to sometimes pause and think and they, but they, they get through it. When we get to the end of the game, of the exercise and we ask feedback, how was that? How did it feel? And it was fun. Was it hard? And many times they say yes. And then we ask them, but did you find that you were actually listening with a completely open mind to the person right through to the very end? And it's like you see these little light bulbs going on because you have to listen to the end first to get the whole thread of the story because you have to build something together, but you also have to listen to the end of the last word. And how often do we, and I am as guilty of this as, as other people, how often are we in a meeting that somebody's talking and we've already formulated our answer while they're still talking? Uh, we're no longer paying attention. And we've found, we've, we've received uh, emails back from the people we've worked with talking about how much more collaborative and how much more respectful the workplace is when people apply these principles. So that's a quick example. Thanks for that, uh, John. And full disclosure, um, John and Vicky, are, are, I'm, I've started a beginner's class in improv myself and it's, um, I just absolutely love it for all sorts of reasons. So um, they're my teachers, they're my teachers. Uh, and they can be your teachers too. So I'm going to open up the floor to um, all, you know, any sort of um, of the other um, Avengers want to come in in terms of what we're discussing, but also the audience as well. You can come in with questions. Uh, I can then unmute you if you want, or um, I'll just get your questions. But why don't I just open up the floor just now to um, David, Vicky, John, and, and, and Alex. Do you, oh, I need to. Okay, I'm going to wave here. I'm not sure this is, uh, I'm sure it's good from a, I'm, I'm coming to you, David, I'm coming to you. Okay, you're on. I just, thank you so much. I just want to say a quick thing that occurred to me listening to my colleagues here. And it's something which um, has kind of crept on me as I've worked in organizations, in, uh, both in the arts, but also a lot in business. And it's just this notion uh, it's very individualistic our times it's people feel very much there's them and there's everybody else and a lot of human development seems to be related to how am i going to get on and what do i need to do and as time's gone on um it seems to be more we basically are connected and it's very interesting when you start feeling you're much more connected to both the people around you and the world around you and i think it's particularly with all the geopolitical stuff going on i think it's it's really important what you're doing gib which is giving a, people a chance to notice actually how connected we can be uh, when the illusion of disconnection is removed which is i just put that out there and don't know if that resonates with anyone thanks for, thanks very much indeed david i i appreciate that any other any other hands going up and if you want to come in and I will. Yeah, I, I just wanted to pick up on this question from Rini, which um, I mean, I think what David's talking about there is really interesting that we are connected. Um, rini has got a question here and I apologize if I haven't pronounced your name correctly there. What do you think of the concept of unintentional drift where you get to where you need to without being conscious of the whole journey? Uh, I wonder if you um, want to jump on and just share a little bit more about what you mean uh, by that question. I think I understand it, but I'd love to hear a little bit more what you actually mean to make sure that we answer it correctly. I'm going to unmute. You're unmuted if you want to chime in, but you're put on the spot there. <laughs> just a wee bit. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. And I'm and I'm guessing you're, well, I know you're well, you're from Butte as well, Rini. Uh, well, you're living in Butte, but uh, I love the Scottish accent. Give us a Craig Beeroch. <laughs> Craig Beeroch. Um, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's, just, it's, it's just one of these things where, um, coming from the private sector and now working in the third sector and not really, be, not really making a, a huge conscious decision that I wanted to work for good and do good work um, and then finding yourself where just exactly where you need to be um, and working with incredible people and achieving uh, real change um, within the community and um, and then taking time to reflect and thinking that all the experiences and all the learning that I had in the private sector 
just was the right things to happen in order that for me to be where I am now, delivering the work that I do now. Um, I don't know if that... that which which is running an amazing social enterprise on the island. I'll blow your trumpet for you. But um, thanks, Rini. Any, any do you want to comment on, on that? Any of the Avengers want to sort of chime in? Vicky, uh, any time. Okay. okay. Oh, no, um, you're open. You're open. Great. Uh, Rini, th thank you very much for that. I, I connect so much to what you're saying. And I, uh, I um, it, what it makes me think of is a commencement speech that Steve Jobs gave many years ago now, uh, where he spoke about um, a few random things that he did just because he was interested in them uh, as he was a teenager and, and, a, and a bit later, that when it came to creating Apple, all came together to make him be in the right place at the right time with the right experience. So I think, um, you know, he had taken a calligraphy class, which made him care about the, the aesthetics of Apple more than your average computer um, program creator would care. And that's something that I found very much in my life uh, as well, that I just sort of did things because I thought they were fun, not because I knew where I was going. And the, the thing that I found so powerful from Steve Jobs' speech was his idea that the path becomes clear when we look back at it, not looking forward. So you, we can do nothing but take the next step that seems interesting or seems right to us. And in retrospect, all the steps we take inevitably lead us to where we are and make a lot of sense where we are. Thanks, Vicky. That's great. I think there's a, another question just come in. It's a, it's a tricky one. If I only have, Nick is saying, and I'll say it, read it out for him. If I only have one minute to relax, <laughs> what is the best tip or what, what should I do? Um, this herein lies the problem, right? Herein lies the problem. But any quick tips of what you would do? As there's, a um, there's a, here's a really quick one. There's an app I came across, which is one minute meditations. I, I just close my eyes and take some deep breaths, really focusing on just feeling the breath go into my diaphragm and out of it. Excellent. Any other tips? David, what do you do to relax in one minute? He gets unmuted. <laughs> um, I, why is it only him that, yeah, look, look, look he's, he's desperately, he can talk with his hands. Okay, you are unmuted now. Go on. Yeah, I, I, would, yeah, I would agree. There's a, a sensei friend of mine has got a three breath meditation that she just do three breaths. So, but I think it's, it's a little bit what John was saying. Um, uh, it's kind of noticing. The breathing's super helpful. I mean, it just slows you down, but noticing what's going on is, is super, super helpful. And you can do that in the cracks. I think, I think the art of living these days is, 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 is juicing the cracks, is noticing where there's a gap and living into that. Uh, and there are, the day is mostly gaps if you look. They're, but they're just micro gaps. There's lots of them, but you really have to watch. <laughs> I think that's a really interesting point, David. It, it is ultimately about being present. One of the things I realized um, recently is that it really doesn't matter what you do. I mean, there's the, the famous story of um, JFK going to NASA and he meets the cleaner and he says, so, so son, what do you do? And the cleaner says, well, I send people to the moon. And whether the story is true or not doesn't really matter. The point is that he was more focused on the why than the what. And that kind of connects back to what uh, Vicky was just saying there in answer to Rumi's question, which is, um, is the, you know, we spend all this time worrying about what we do, right? We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do the other. Actually, the what will take care of itself if you focus on the why and the how. The why being your purpose and the how being your values or how you choose to live your life. And, and I think that's very, very true that, that, you know, we focus, we're so obsessed with what we're doing, you know, are we doing this or are we doing that? Actually, how and why I think is, is way more important. And so to bring it back to what David just said there, it's actually about being present in every moment. And we hear a lot about presence and it's becoming a buzzword. But what does that really mean? It means not thinking about the future, not thinking about the past, being just right here in this moment. And that's not easy to do because there's so much information that we're receiving that makes it difficult. So one of the things I do, I don't like to use that app, is I'll just go and sketch. 
And I realized that sketching is just my vehicle to get myself present to observing what's happening with that mountain. How is the light falling? How is the lake moving? How is, how are the clouds moving? How is the sun? And, but, but there are thousands of techniques to do that. We call them by multiple different names. We say, oh, meditation, you need to meditate. All that's doing is bringing us to this moment. So we're aware of this moment, this moment, this moment. Excellent. Really good. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll come to, to you in a second, David. I, I saw your sketch coming up there, which is, is going to be sent out with the materials after the call uh, for people to rate. But John, I think you had your hand up uh, just before. Well, it's, yeah, that, that I was, uh, you, you were wisely keeping me muted. So uh, the, the conversation has moved on a bit, but very quickly in response to Rini's comment and Vicky's uh, discussion of Steve Jobs' talk ties in nicely with this. You talked about unintentional drift and, and the conversation that I was hearing from different fronts, it made me, it reminded me of a, of a great book called Flow by a Hungarian, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And he talks in essence about, have you ever been in these moments, whether you're climbing, you know, climbing a mountain or playing a game of chess or sketching or drawing, a, you know, painting or doing whatever, composing music, and you're so into it and you're just completely lost in it. And then you look up and three hours have gone by and it just flew by. And so I don't think it's more drift. I think this all ties into this concept of really just being present on in, and in the moment and enjoying this one thing. So that's the comment on that. Brilliant. And, and David, a quick, a quick comment, then I'm going to sort of move on to the next uh, bit of the agenda. I know we're running a slightly late. Yes, sorry. But I, 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 can you hear me? Have I been on? Yes. Yeah, I can. So just very briefly, I've just finished writing a book called Wonderful, which was about, based on the experiences I've had with street wisdom and and improv and other things. And I, 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 to go back to Rini's comment, such a great comment, because I think, I think what we need to cultivate is intentional drift, which is the sense of having an intention and then letting it come. And I think a lot of businesses need deceleration because what they do is they fix on something and they go for it in a straight line as fast as possible. And it may not be the right thing. So I think it's this, it's this ability to allow yourself, allow allow yourself to wander produces actually richer results than accelerating a straight line. But we can talk more about that. I'll agree. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of agreements there. And, and your book is available in all good bookshops uh, near people and um, for discount and will be handed out to all those who make it to the uh, decelerator uh, event. So um, folks, this, is, this has been a, a, a fun webinar. It's like the movie trailer, I suppose, for um, if, if, you, if you like this kind of 15, 20 minutes, then imagine what we can do in a week together. So um, let me just, um, if I can, go to the next bit of the agenda, which is on the 18th to 22nd of November, which don't let anyone tell you that Scotland is not a beautiful place to be at that time of year. Uh, you will see the mountains, and this is a, a picture that was taken by a friend of mine, that is looking across to Arran from Butte on a sunny day, probably not November, but um, it will be fantastic and there will be warmth and light uh, uh, there aplenty. Um, high level, and we're, we're going to be together for five days. People will arrive in the morning on the Monday and you'll get home in the afternoon on a Friday. And although we're talking about a Scottish island, it's the most accessible Scottish island that, that, that you can have. Um, you, can, you can get there from Glasgow in about an hour and a half and to get to Glasgow from London, whether you're coming by train uh, in a sort of eco-friendly way or by flight, boo, you can get there relatively uh, quickly, Edinburgh or Glasgow. And you'll see that the week has sort of the afternoon, first afternoon, I'll go into the, the, the detail of this uh, now very quickly, or you can read the detail, and I'm going to shift uh, the video box out the way of the slide, so hopefully if people are seeing that. Um, after you've arrived, the Monday afternoon, we were looking at who you are. Um, I don't want to know what your job title is. I don't want to know, and nobody else wants to really know what achievements you've had or, or, or things, or whether you're from the private sector or you work in a bank or whether you work in an NGO. We're just going to come as ourselves, as individuals, and we're going to show up and we'll get aligned and you'll hear a bit more about the craft from each of the, um, each of the, uh, the, the Avengers there. Each evening will have a different event. Pearls of Wisdom, you can guess that that could well be David Pearl giving you a, an evening there on that first, uh, first evening. And then in the, the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it's going to be breakout groups. 
And you can see the breakouts on the top right hand there, whereby you may be going to, to, to paint and find, and find your inner creator, if you will, uh, with Alex helping on that. You may well be getting introduced to the basics of, of improv with Vicky and, uh, and, and John. There are other coaches around. I know that Barbara's on the, on the call and uh, she's amazing at doing visioning workshops. And in fact, this vision for Craig Beer came out of a workshop that Barbara did together with her partner, uh, Peter, who looks at money and our relationship to money and source and um, what it is that makes you who you are, if you will. We even get things like horse coaching, you know, and I've just written about this in my monthly uh, blog. But uh, what you can learn in terms of working with animals like horses that they can tell you that you maybe don't understand even about yourself. Someone that's not on the call today because I think he is in the middle of nowhere. Um, or somewhere even more remote than the middle of nowhere, maybe the outskirts of nowhere. But Callum runs the Extraordinary Adventure Company and he takes people on experiential um, uh, wilderness treks, if you will. And he will be taking people out into the beautiful parts of Butte where you really will disconnect uh, and reconnect uh, with yourself. No, doesn't so we will be doing that um, in the evening. There's Barbara speaking. Barbara, you've... Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm short of time here at the moment, so I'm just going to give you give the quick summary of the Seventh Heaven dinner in the evening on the Tuesday. That's going to be a different meal, a different meal for each of the chakras, the seven chakras. We're going to be having um, evening classes on the Wednesday night and and the, even a Kaylee one evening as well. And there's also going, it sounds very busy, there's also going to be um, some Ma, which is a new concept that I have been uh, introduced to, but Ma is intentional space, a Japanese term, the space between the notes. So we will have some mass. I don't think that you're going to come here and every minute of every day you're going to be jammed full of things. You will have space to be on your own, to explore, to walk. And of course, the mornings will start off with maybe a good breakfast and some yoga. And then there will be time at lunchtime and in the evenings to have space to yourself. So a full program, but not a crammed program is what I would uh, absolutely say. So um, I'm realizing and I want to be conscious of everybody's time. We have two minutes left to, uh, to leave. Um, I'm getting a, ah yes, I'm getting a reminder from, uh, from Nick here. If you want to come along to this, I, I want this first pilot, and it is going to be a pilot, to be co-created in some way, to involve as many of you as possible from whatever background and, uh, that you have. And, um, we need to cover costs, obviously, but there is an early bird discount available until the end of tomorrow, really. Um, so if you're interested in coming, ping me a note or ping a note to info at Big Bureau <laughs> and, uh, and, and come along. And um, if, you know, your company is not able to, to, to pay for you or your organization, you're paying on your own, we have uh, competitive payment terms as well for, for getting people along. So I want, I want as many people to get there as can be there and um, it is co-creation and that's where the quid pro quo comes from if we're doing this again which is what we will in the new year we will learn from this first this gathering so i think um that's it can i kind of in the last um 30 seconds can i maybe get a, a kind of one word check out from our uh, our avengers i want to thank you all very much for joining it's been a rich discussion so um one word check out from uh, each of the uh, Avengers, and then we will go. Are you unmuted? John. I'll start. Uh, just delighted to be a part of this. I was excited speaking with Gibb and Vicky in Geneva about it. I'm even more excited about it now. I don't see, I see myself as a full participant going in there to learn way more than I will be able to impart. So great to be a part of it. Thank you, Gibb. Excellent. Thanks. And I think David, you're unmuted. Yeah, I think I should sing. Andiam cerca fortuna, which means let's go and find fortune. <laughs> Thank you very much. Did you follow that, uh, Alex? Um, well, the, you know, it was David. So, um, so how do I follow that with the word unmute? Obviously, um, <laughs> it's been the most popular word I think we've used on this entire webinar. And if that's true, then I'm going to slightly change it and say, what is this really about? It's about unleashing ourselves so that the greater part of us, our greater purpose flows through. And not just individually, 
But the great thing about this group is that we're doing it collectively. And if you haven't noticed, we, you know, we haven't worked together and yet everything that we're talking about seems to chime together. Everything we're talking about seems to flow. So if this can happen in 40 minutes, 45 minutes on a call, just imagine what's going to happen when we get together with all of you and create something extraordinary. Thanks, Alice. And, and uh, thanks for that comment. Butte will, we will unmute on Butte. There will be no technology. We will be offline. Vicky, the last word to you. Possibility. Ah, I love it. I love it. Okay, ran over two minutes, but hey, improv as it is. So thank you very much, Avengers, again. Thanks for everybody that's on the call. That's great. And uh, to those that watch the replay, hopefully see many of you on the Isle of Butte. Over and out. <laughs>